Today I'm joined by Michelle Rossi from the Ralph Wallenberg Center for Human Rights, Michael Levitt, FSWC President and CEO, and of course, our wonderful guest speaker for today, Nate Leiptiger. To begin, Michelle will offer some opening remarks. Michelle Rossi recently joined the Ralph Wallenberg Center as a legal and project intern, and she's also currently pursuing a civil law degree from the University of Ottawa. Throughout summer 2020, she worked at Montreal City Mission's Just Solutions Legal Clinic, specializing in refugee and humanitarian law. Prior to her legal studies, she earned a Bachelor of Arts degree from Concordia University, where she completed an undergraduate thesis exploring citizenship precarity. Her research centered on Hannah Arendt's definition of the refugee and theory of totalitarianism, namely the decline of the nation state. Welcome, Michelle. Hi, everyone. It's great to be with all of you today. I'd like to welcome you all on behalf of the Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights, and I'd like to give a very special welcome to our speaker today, Nate Leipziger and his daughter, Arla Litwin. Thank you both for taking the time to join us. The partnership between the Friends of Simon Wiesenthal Center for Holocaust Studies and the Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights is paramount in the education of Canadians about the legacy of the Holocaust, as well as the importance of standing up for human rights. The centrality of remembering and acting upon the testimony of Holocaust survivors to combat anti-Semitism and all forms of hate and mass atrocities is especially important in promoting the principles of tolerance and social justice through advocacy and education. In another session of, conversa of In Conversation with a Survivor series, Nate Leipziger will be sharing his powerful story with us today and his strong commitment to education as an important way to combat injustice, coupled with sensitivity, understanding, and compassion for other human beings. Without further ado, Arla, I would like to hand you over the floor. And Nate, we look forward to learning from you. Thank you so much, Michelle. We appreciate you joining us this afternoon for this programming and of course for the ongoing partnership with the Ralph Wallenberg Center. As you've heard, Arla Litwin, Nate's daughter, will be interviewing him today. Nate Leipziger was born in Poland. He survived six years of Nazi occupation in degradation, humiliation, and brutality. Nate and his father were liberated in May of 1945 and came to Canada in 1948. Arla, Nate, welcome. We're so honored to have you both here with us for this important program. Thank you so much, Daniela. Uh, before we start talking about Nate's experiences during the war, we're just going to create some background. And Dad, I'd like to ask you about your life before the war. So can you tell us a little bit about what it was like living in Poland as a young man? Well, uh, before the war, that is uh, before I was uh, 11 years old. And um, I, in the fall of, in the spring of uh, 1939, I finished grade four and uh, we went on summer vacations and uh, into the mountains. And we had a very non, a very life, which was in 1938, uh, 39, uh, Poland was very much like the life in Canada. Uh, the reason why I'm saying that is because uh, people have an idea uh, that Poland was a, a, a shtetl that was, a, you know, from, uh, uh, you remember the Fiddler on the Roof stories, it's nothing like that. We lived in a large city. We had uh, life not, not unlike the life that uh, we had in, in Canada, and uh, we were of the actually not very well off. We were lived in, a, in an apartment uh, that you can show uh, on the slide uh, now, uh, which uh, was uh, uh, middle middle of uh, actually uh, uh, lower middle income, model model uh, lower mi middle class, and uh, you can see that uh, this was taken in 1975, and uh, 20 years, 30 years after the. Uh, we, uh, after the war and some uh, 35 years after we left this place and it's in disrepair because uh, the landlord, uh, the absentee landlord uh, was a Jewish family whose uh, building was confiscated and uh, uh, that was it. That's the, my backyard that you see a couple kids playing there. That was, could have been me. Uh, this is 19, could have been 1938. Thank you, Art Garland. 
And uh, so we, we went on uh, as if nothing happened. Of course, 1939 and in, in the summer of 39, there was lots of talk about the war with uh, Nazi Germany and uh, uh, people are very nervous because uh, they remember the First World War and they were predicting that this war, this war will be much more brutal than the one in 1914, uh, 1914 to 1918 in that uh, there were airplanes and they, uh, in the 1918, 1418 war, there was, they were using gas. And so they anticipated that the Germans will be using uh, poison gas again against the civilian population. We prepared uh, masks and stuff like that. And, uh, uh, my father actually sent us away from our hometown, which was uh, southwest uh, Poland and to the northern part of Poland, where, where we were a few kilometers away from uh, the German border, and uh, we were there anticipating uh, the the war. And of course, the war did come, and it was uh, we were attacked from the air, and uh, people lost their lives. And uh, shortly thereafter, we uh, were occupied. Did you did your family ever consider leaving Poland prior to the war, or when when the war was clearly on the horizon? Yes, that's that's a very big question because uh, in hindsight uh, is 2020, but in 1939 or 38 and 36 before the war started, uh, you know, up to 1939, people were hoping that the war will not start because of the uh, pact, non-aggression pact between France, Britain, and uh, Poland. And they did not think that Germany would risk going to war with uh, those, uh, with uh, England and with uh, France. But of course, the story was that we had nowhere to go. In 1938, 39, we had nowhere to go. The Americans were not prepared to accept any uh, refugees. We saw that, that in Anschluss on 1938, when uh, so the Nazis marched into Austria, which they call the Anschluss, suddenly they became, there are hundreds of thousands of refugees became inland refugees. The uh, Austrian government, like the German government in 1935, deprived the Jews of citizenship. So the Jews became stateless. And they couldn't go to uh, countries like America because they didn't have, they, America had a, had a quota system. So there was great pressure on Roosevelt in 1938 to uh, take some refugees. So he wanted to spread this problem and he convened 32 nations in the Avian Conference in France. 32 nations came together, including Canada. And wouldn't you know it? 32 nations, and I think there were at that time about 600,000 uh, refugees in, in, uh, in Germany, which means that if every nation of the 32 took 20,000 refugees, which is nothing, the, so this, the problem would solve. But none of those, except the Dominican Republic, was prepared to take any of the refugees that were found themselves in. So this was, you know, and the, 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 the the ship of uh, the uh, St. Louis that uh, went to, uh, in 1938, uh, 1939, went to the shores of uh, uh, Cuba, United States, and Canada. And uh, none of those countries were to admit any of the Jewish refugees. When the refugees were came back to, to Europe, Hitler said in his speeches, he says, nobody wants the Jews. We are entitled to, to deal with the Jews as we want. That was the, 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 the I think that was the solve the beginning solve of uh, Nazi Germany against the Jews. And uh, when Germany, when the Nazis marched into Poland, your family had returned to Chojiv at that time, your hometown, uh, but your family was expelled from Chojiv. Can you describe where you went at that time and how your life changed? Well, the Nazi occupation was a blitzkrieg. Another, they, they occupied all of Poland in 24 days. 
and uh, as soon as they as soon as they occupied the cities and we lived in a city that was annexed immediately annexed to germany after they occupied it and uh, that's the lower Sil upper silesia and uh, immediately uh, we were my father was uh, shipped away to the east uh, to a work camp he was they were told and all men, all capable men of, uh, I think, uh, 16 to 44 were shipped out of uh, our hometown. And, uh, you know, we were devastated because suddenly uh, we lost our father. And uh, just weeks, just a couple of weeks before he was shipped off, he was called to the city hall, uh, the, the Nazi city hall. And uh, he was asked to bring the keys to to the store that he was operating. And uh, uh, he, he was told that now this is the property of the Third Reich. He cannot go in and take anything out of it. And suddenly uh, we became uh, without a father, without means of support. And only a few days later, we were ordered to uh, uh, get out of uh, Hojruf, out of uh, uh, our hometown and uh, we moved on, on to Sosnovets, which was uh, also in the same in the upper Silesia area, but uh, they allowed Jews to live there, whereas our hometown was uh, made uh, Jewish, uh, Jew free. Yeah. And uh, all the families that uh, lived in our hometown had to leave. Of course, uh, Sosnovets was a different situation because there was one third of the population of Sosnovets was Jewish. Now, Sosnovich was a, an open ghetto. So, so how is that different from other ghettos? I'm sorry? Sosnovich was an open ghetto. Yes. So how did that differ from other ghettos that we've heard about? Yes, well, as compared to um, the lodge, I mean, the, there were three ghettos which were a wall and there were the first one, the largest one was Warsaw. The second one was uh, uh, Lvov or uh, Lemberg. Lvov. I'm sorry, uh, Luj. Ritzmann stuff, Luj. And the third one was Krakow, which was not far from us. And uh, those, uh, those, those are the main camps that were, those uh, were the main ghettos that were actually uh, walled in and people could not leave uh, at all. Uh, we did not have that situation. We were, there were no walls that, that defined our ghetto. We were, in Sosnovets after we were deported from Hoshul, actually the life became quite normal. The Nazis have not started their, uh, their persecution of the Jews as, as such. Uh, they closed all the Jewish schools. Uh, my father was asked uh, by the ghetto, the Juden Eltas, the, the leader of the ghetto, to uh, volunteer to go to a labor camp. And uh, he left and uh, he actually uh, came back four months later. And he told us that the situation in the, in the, in the labor camp were, were quite uh, livable. And uh, uh, just after a few months later, he was uh, asked, uh, he came back and then he, came, he was asked again by the Jewish community leader to go to volunteer to another camp. And this time there were 2,000 people. The first time there was 400. There's 2,000 people from Sosnovets. And um, they were again promised that uh, everything will be, that there will, the conditions will be the same. And the description of the people that went, the 400 people that came back, most of them volunteered again because they were free to leave the camp the first time and they could go into the villages. They actually were sending parcels uh, back to Poland uh, for us, which was a great uh, boost to our, uh, our livelihood. And so this time they went, uh, but instead of uh, finding an open camp as the first one, this, this, this one was operated by the SS and it had barbed wire and strict uh, and very uh, minimal amount of food. Uh, they could not leave, it was electrified fences, and it was a serious concentration camp. And uh, my father stayed there for over a year. And then he made himself, he went to uh, uh, 
sick leave. And since they didn't have an infirmary in uh, the camp that he was, they sent them to Poland, back to, to the Sosnowiec, and he escaped from that, from that, uh, that, uh, that uh, facility. And uh, he actually was asked by the Jewish community, because he escaped, uh, the, the leader uh, of the community said, uh, you have two choices. One is uh, you go back uh, and, uh, and uh, you, we'll catch you and you'll go back with you and your family's going to be deported or you volunteer to become a policeman and your family will be saved. To be a policeman was not a very attractive job because it, uh, it involved controlling the Jewish population and uh, it, even at that time the Jewish police did not have a very good reputation. So he was very reluctant and they discussed about my mother about the possibility of what, what could be done and there was no choice. It was a, you know, a choiceless choice. And so he accepted the position. As far as I know, during the tenure, during the time that he was a policeman and the Jewish police, he had no repercussion, there were no repercussions. I didn't hear anything bad against him. So I, I cannot say that he was uh, exactly, a, uh, you know, a, a typical police um, policeman in that force. And uh, life went on and, you know, we had to, at times where were, we had to go to soup kitchen because there were no food in the ghetto. And uh, we didn't have enough money to buy the ration cards that we did have. So uh, that was, that was, was a difficult time. I went to a trade school. I became 1940. I went to a trade school because uh, there was no school. So I learned how to become an electrician's helper. And uh, then I got a job in a factory, in a shoe factory and life went on till uh, 1942, 42 was the first deportation from our uh, city and uh, it was terrible. And uh, so we, we knew that uh, deportation sooner or later will come. We built uh, hiding places because when we went to work, we would go, we would never knew when we returned whether the families that were in the ghetto would still be still be there. In, in 1943, in the very early spring of 43, my family was moved to another ghetto called Shrodula. And uh, there we were much more exposed because there was a village uh, with nothing around, just uh, fields around the village. So it was very easy for the Nazis to surround it and to uh, deport us. But, and that's, you know, that's, uh, we, we built hiding places in, in anticipation that there will be more deportations. Then on August the 2nd, 1943, your family was finally taken from the ghetto. Can you describe what happened on that day? Yes, it was a terrible day. Actually, the, the terrible day was the day before us, the day before on August the 1st, which was uh, Sunday and uh, Saturday, uh, Saturday night, Sunday. And um, we knew that there was a deportation coming and uh, we hid. And unfortunately, we had two hiding places and the first hiding place that we built by ourselves, uh, boys from the, from the apartment building. And uh, we were prepared for to, to spend some time in this uh, hiding places. But when we got to the first hiding place, we found that there was occupied by other people that were from a different building and you couldn't dislodge them. They, they just said, you think our life is more, your life is more valuable than ours. And so we had to leave and go to the secondary land. And we went to the secondary hiding place and there a woman arrived with a young, very young child, maybe three or four days old, and she wanted to be admitted. And of course, the, the, the people were very much, the, the people who were guiding, uh, guarding the entrance to the hiding place 
were very uh, dis very disturbed and anxious that the the baby may may uh, uh, give us away. But at any rate, finally they agreed to let her go, and she came into the into a hiding place. Unfortunately, we were found, and we were pulled up to, out of our out of hiding place. And uh, at, at the same time. We, we, we noticed that the baby was dead. Somehow or other, uh, she was suffocated by somebody in the hiding place so as not to give us, give us away. But as a, as a, as a penalty for uh, hiding, we were not allowed to take our parcels with us. So we had to leave our home with just what we were, wore on our backs. And it was, it was August, it was a very, very hot day. And so the women were just wear summer dresses and we were in shorts and, and shirts and that's it. And uh, we were taken from our home, marched through the city. The Polish people were on both sides of us as we marched through. Some women were crying, some were wringing their hands. And uh, some were saying, uh, away with you, Jews, you know, Pratshadami, you know, away with you. And uh, were jeering us. But um, um, the, I would say the majority were stoic and uh, some women were crying. So we knew that nothing is, nothing good awaits us. And um, we were taken to the station in Benjin, the rail station in Benjin. We were, had to spend the night there. And of course, it was a terrible, terrible situation. Women were uh, trying to, to help the children. The children were crying. They want to go home. They want food. They want water. No food, no water was available. We had to sleep on the concrete floor outside the station. And finally, everything went quiet until the morning. Very early in the morning, suddenly bedlam started again and uh, the train arrived and we were put on a train. And we went put a, we were put on a train as a family. My mother, my sister, my father and myself. And we were there in the middle of a railroad car, sort of huddled together. My father and my mother held their hands around the children. And uh, they were deciding as to what's going to happen. My mother said, whoever survives will uh, meet at, my, at her mother's uh, neighbor, who is a Christian woman. At that time, the words, whoever survived, did not mean anything to me because I did not feel that our life was in danger. And, but nevertheless, that's what she said. And uh, we arrived at a place which we did not know where we are. We got off the train. We were in the last car. And when we arrived in, on the railroad siding, we were the first car to disembark. And we were standing there, oh, this was Bedlam there. People were told to abandon their packages that they will be delivered to them later on. And um, uh, we were uh, uh, separated into men and women. I stayed, stood with my mother and my father came over to me and he says, you come with me. And he pulled me by my sleeve and we were standing in the first row of men and my mother and my sister were in the first row of women. And uh, a few minutes later, my father was told to line up the man that he was sent to and um, I lined them up in five and marched them up. And he was doing that. And I was sent to the other side, to another column where I was with older, older people, my uncle, uh, some boys 12 years old uh, and older. And then there was a column, there were two columns of women. I noticed, so I was standing in this new lineup and I was trying to see what's happening, what the situation, what, how, what's happening here. And I saw my father was with the young people lining them up. And my mother and my sister were with the young people in the women's group. 
And then there were the two groups uh, and with uh, women and men. I saw my girlfriend in the with the old women, with the women, with the older women, and they were being loaded on a truck. When I suddenly heard my name being called, and I jumped out of the thing, and I there was a, my uh, my father was an assessment, and he said, "This is my my son, and he's 17 years old." As I was 15 at that point. He's an electrician, which is true. He worked at a shoe factory for two years, which was true. And the Nazi questioned me for a few seconds. I spoke perfect German and he said, okay, take him. So there I stood, we, a few minutes later, we marched off past barbed wires and building some buildings. And I didn't think of it any very much. We are just going to where, where we were being directed. When we got to the building, we were told to barrack, we told to undress. My father caught up with me and uh, we're told to undress. Uh, they uh, shaved our hair, they beloused us uh, with uh, some a stinging solution and then they the two hour number and then they gave us a lecture. And that was, that was the most devastating information that I could hear. The couple who was talking to us said, you are now in a concentration camp of Auschwitz-Birkenau. Your lifespan is four months. If you uh, are lucky, you get shipped out uh, to another camp in Germany. Or if you get assigned to work here, your life is, your lifespan is four months. And if you don't behave, you will be processed the way you will be shipped to uh, being processed where your parents, your spouses and your brothers and sisters are now being processed. And then he saw, he, he hesitated and he said, they're being gassed to death. I couldn't believe my ear, my eye, my ears. I looked at my father and he shook his head. He said, that's what the reality is. Now, how do you, how do you, rationalize that type of information? How do you process it in your mind that innocent people, men, women, and children are being gassed to death? There's no trial, no, no penalty, uh, just being gassed, just rounded up. A few, a few hours before, we were a family. We were in a city. We were in a ghetto, but we were free to move around. We didn't have where much to eat. But whatever we had, we could, we could control. We can, we could make whatever we could do, and we, we could survive as long as we were a family. We felt that we had a future. We had most possibility of surviving the war. But here, now we, I was by myself with my father. I was lucky to be with my, my father. Most everybody else was just by themselves. That train of car was the, the last time that we were together as a family. It was the transition point between the freedom and incarceration, between being a human being to being a number. That was a very, very difficult time. And it's uh, one of the momentous events of uh, my youth. And uh, it was terrible loss that, uh, I didn't know whether my mother and my mother, my sister would even survive. When you, so you were in Auschwitz for, um, I think about four months and eventually you were selected. Would you say it a little louder, please? Sorry. So you were in Auschwitz for about four months during which there were selections, but you managed to stay where you were until um, you were finally um, sent to a concentration camp of Feinstein, I knew I would screw that up. Fifteichen. Fifteichen. Um, can you tell us what life was like once you got out of Auschwitz and into the concentration camp? Yes, well, first of all, I'll tell you a little bit of Auschwitz because that was, uh, you know, once we got into the camp in Auschwitz, there was a transition camp we were just like merchandise on a shelf from which they weekly they selected people 
who were weak or, or young in my case, who were not capable of heavy labor, they were the poor taking them out and they were sending them to be processed. We, this time we knew already what was happening. And, uh, you know, we were sitting there for, uh, for as you said, four months or actually three months and a bit. And uh, we were watching the transport from uh, other ghettos coming by, walking past our, fen our fence uh, to the crematoria four and five. And we knew that these people did not know what was going to happen to them. They marched, they walked uh, with uh, children, women and children going through the death. And we were sitting there, we were calling, we said, saying, where is the, where is the world? How come the world does not react? to the murder of innocent people. And my father said, the world does not know. Otherwise, and this is 1943. In 1943, the allies knew what was happening, but they, they did not care. They did not want to intervene on behalf of the Jews. That was the situation. You know, England closed the immigration to, to uh, Palestine. So the Jews who, who could get out, couldn't have where to go. The, Borders of all the countries were closed. That's so I hold all the nations, all the free nations of the West responsible for what was happening to us because they knew and they did nothing. And that's so part of the responsibility of what happened to us stays on their shoulder. You know, of course, I had to hide while I was in the camp and we did hide. Finally, we were fortunate to be selected to go on a transport to go to, go to Germany, we were sent to Fünfzeichen. 600, 650 Jewish men were sent from Auschwitz to Fünfzeichen to a Krupp, Krupp factory, which at that point had around 3,000 uh, prisoners. The 2,400 prisoners that we joined were mainly Polish prisoners, political prisoners, prisoners, political prisoners who were uh, in the underground or suspected of being underground, who uh, were uh, uh, who act, who committed acts of sabotage. These were the people who we were. So now we found ourselves again in as a minority, but we were again in a, in a, we we were. We were, we were suspecting that we were in a hostile environment, not only on the outside of the camp by the Nazis, but also the, in the inside the camp, there were Polish uh, people who um, we were assuming they were anti-Semitic. To my surprise, the people who were in the camp were not anti-Semitic. They did not go after us. They respected us. We went to work with them. We marched together. We uh, were on the, on the Appell Platz together. Nobody bothered us. I was there for, you know, 16 months, and I had not, I had not detected one act of anti-Semitism or hostility from the Polish prisoners. We were, we were, we were, we had a common destiny. We knew that whatever happened to one happens to the to the other, and. Uh, Life in a concentration camp, Fünfzeichen, was possible. There was, they gave us enough food, so we wa we walked and we worked for twelve hours. We were given enough food uh, to survive, but not enough, not to keep on losing weight or or lo losing energy. And this this happened until 1940, 19 June January 1945. Uh, I at the last, the last few months, I was very fortunate that uh, I was uh, through a fluke and uh, intervention of a, a Jewish doctor. I was admitted into the infirmary uh, first as a patient, and then I was allowed to stay on as an orderly to uh, help the doctor in in the, in the infirmary and also. To look after him personally, I was very, very fortunate that uh, I was not uh, socially, I mean, uh, sexually abused. Also, in my previous barracks, I was, and uh, I did not tell my father about it. 
or anybody else that I was ashamed of the fact that I was sexually abused. That was not, later on I found out that uh, it uh, was a common feeling by the, by the victim not to, not to tell about the experience. They were ashamed, we were ashamed of the fact that we were sexually abused. And I didn't tell about that, didn't tell my story about sexual abuse for many, many years after the liberation. What do you think was the biggest factor in staying alive during those years? Yes, the, the biggest factor was uh, to be unnoticed, to be a, a model prisoner, not to go places where you're not supposed to, not to uh, do anything which was against the rules. As long as you were part of the masses, I never walked on the outside of the row, I always make sure that I'm inside uh, inside the row. There were five people in a row. There was, so I had two people on either side of me. That was sort of like a buffer zone and uh, against the, being hit by uh, by the uh, gun barrel of, 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 the, of the guards to, who were uh, prodding us to move faster. Uh, or in the ghetto, in the, sorry, in the, in the camp itself, I kept to myself, I didn't, do anything that was, uh, you know, when Sunday was the only day where we were allowed to uh, wash our uniforms, to, sh to shower and to shave, uh, those who had needed shaving. And uh, it was very important, very important to keep clean and to, become, to retain your humaneness. So, you know, uh, you may have to, the Nazis tried very much to make us like, to, to make us feel like inferior, like animals, like below human uh, human beings, and our 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 struggle was to remain human. To and so we washed our uniforms in cold water and uh, very little soap, and we had to uh, uh, sometimes sleep on it in order because it was still wet, and to dry out under our bodies, and. Um, behave like human beings rather than animals. Uh, when you were eventually... Louder? Sorry, eventually uh, uh, on January 19th, 1945, you were then evacuated from Fimfsteichen. Fimfsteichen. Um, how were you moved? Can you tell us about? Yeah, well, the, in 19, uh, this was the, in January 1945, we were, we saw that the war was going to come, we could hear the war coming closer, bombardment and like, gun sh uh, gunshots and uh, the, uh, the Russian, the Soviets uh, airplanes, they're bombing our factory and uh, from very, very high. Unfortunately, they were very inaccurate because they didn't hit the factory. The only thing they did is they created a boom by exploding bombs in the, in the field surrounding. And they, the only thing that they succeeded in doing was breaking all the windows in the factory. And uh, we, we actually, you know, we're not afraid of the bombers. We, uh, we felt that, uh, you know, at least we are not going to fall prey by the Nazis. And then on the January 19th, 1945, we were moved out of the camp and we did not know how long we we're gonna walk. We did not know how far we we're going to, uh, to have to go. We we're given uh, our uh, a double bread portion and so we knew that we were going to be on the road for at least two or three days. And my father uh, cut the bread up and uh, we hid the bread in our body so that we could eat them as, as we marched along the way. And uh, we had no water and it was winter. Our uniforms were thin, our shoes, uh, sh soon fell apart because uh, we were walking in, uh, in snow, which, uh, uh, you know, by, by that time our camp was around 5,000 people. 5,000 people marching uh, through an area, it soon became mud. And we walked in mud and our shoes and, uh, were wet and our feet were wet. 
And we walked for from very early in the morning till it got dark, about 10, 12 hours in January. And uh, at night we were told to lie down and uh, on straw that they spread on, on the ground or in a barrack. And uh, that's how we spend the night. And uh, the next day we started again. And after the first day, the toll has started to take. Uh, people were exhausted. You know, started the exhaustion. They were exhausted before they left the camp. But after walking one day, they they couldn't walk any further, and so they they fell back. And the Nazis were encouraging them to sit down, and they shot them on the spot and and, 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 and through their head. Sometimes they took two heads, put them one on top of the other, and shot them through. Uh, and uh, it was it was terrible. At that time, we didn't call it a death march, but that's what it became. It, it became a death march. We started out from the camp about 5,000 people. We lost one third of the people that went by the time we arrived in the next camp. We arrived in the next camp with Grossrosen. There we were terribly overcrowded, all the various Camps in the in the uh, on the Polish German border were congregated and were forced into Gross Rosen. We were there for two weeks. The lights were terrible. Uh, we had to carry the dead every every morning. And you went to sleep, and then in the morning you woke up with next to a corpse. And then finally they shipped us out to Berchtesgaden. I mean to uh, Flossenburg. Flossenburg was a camp up high in the mountains and again they gave us a, a, a loaf of bread this time and so we knew we were going to be at least four or five days on the way and uh, my father did the same thing we hid our bread because two days after we were on the train everybody ate their bread and if anybody saw us take out a piece of bread and eat it they would have most likely murdered us for it so we Kept, kept it in our body hidden. And then the, the only time we ate it is at night when nobody could see what we were doing. And we were transported to uh, Flossenburg, which was a very terrible camp. And again, they were, we were only there for two weeks before we were marched on. We were transported to Leonberg, to another camp, a uh, uh, factory, in an underground tunnel. And every time we were transfer transferred, we lost many, many people. 80, 90 people went into a car and about one third people were dead when we left them. There was no food, no water. It was an open car, just an open, uh, open uh, wagon. And uh, at least we had, the only thing we had is snow. And uh, we, managed to survive until we got to Leonberg. In Leonberg, my father got assigned to a factory and uh, working at, he was a, by that time, after uh, two, one, almost two years in, in Fimfeichen, he became a machinist. He was a very valued machinist. So when he got to Leonberg, they assigned him to a machine to uh, rivet the uh, aircraft parts. I was an electrician, so I was, I was uh, put on an electrical company. And I only spent one day in the factory when, the, our, when, the, when our barracks developed typhus fever. And uh, about three or four days later, we were told that we we're gonna be shipped uh, out of the camp to another camp because we had typhus fever. And uh, my father, volunteered to come with me uh, because he was in a different barrack. And uh, the Nazi told him, I says, you, you, you crazy. This is a typhus, a typhus uh, group. You're going to contract typhus. And he says, well, I don't care. I want to be with my son. And uh, we traveled for days in a closed car. There was uh, just a barrel for, uh, was as a washroom, 
and uh, there was no water. We had just uh, that's no water whatsoever, no food whatsoever. We traveled for days like that. And uh, every, every morning we had to take the, the dead people that the corpses that were sleeping among us, that was lying among us and put them in, 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 in a corner where the latrine was or the barrel was. And uh, uh, there was terrible to see how our numbers were diminishing and how we were traveling. Finally, we arrived in a camp. It was a sixth camp, Mildorf Anin, and we were disembarked. And the Nazi said, Nazi officer says, anybody who feels feverish or who feels they're, they're too tired to go on, go register and we'll uh, give you, uh, we'll put you in the hospital. And there were windows in front of the barracks that we stood open and we saw Bar uh, beds, hospital beds with white sheets on them, very inviting. And I, I was almost ready to go. When I was about to step forward, my father put his hand on my shoulder and says, you don't want to go there. And of course, the next morning, they were, we found out that they were taken to a forest and shot. And uh, then uh, we were transferred to another camp, which was a, a, a forest camp. So I take the next slide of the, uh, the camp and, and with the barracks. And uh, there were, the, the camp was buried on the ground. It was uh, in huts, they were like this. Um, the roof was uh, uh, was in, on the ground. The roof was uh, covered with, uh, with sod. And then we slept on those bunks and uh, uh, we were there for about a month. And uh, we were getting weaker and weaker. And at the end, uh, in uh, was uh, the end of uh, March, uh, I, they were they were telling us that they're going to evacuate us, and uh, so I said to my father, I said I can't go on. So we tried to hide in these barracks underneath the boards. You can see the boards uh, where we slept on on the, uh, on the brick front. We tried to lift those boards and to hide underneath them, but we could not find a spot where we could hide. Some people were there and already hiding and we couldn't find. So finally, I, we were moving to the gate and I said to my father, you go ahead, I, I'm not gonna go. I'm not, I'd rather take my chances, whatever they're gonna do with the camp. Thank you for the slide. Uh, whatever they're gonna do to, with, the, with the camp, I'm going to stay here and uh, uh, whatever will happen, will happen. And my father says, there's no way you're gonna do that. You're coming with me, I'm not gonna give up now. So we moved towards the gate and we're sort of last to, to, to leave the camp. I saw the commandant of that camp and I went up to him and I said, sir, I can't, can't walk. Uh, I'm sure I'm not gonna make it to the next stop. And I." And I, I'm rather, I, I'm sorry, I, I'd rather die here than die on the road. And he took one look at me. By that time I had, I was exposed to typhus fever. I was totally emaciated. I was what they know called as a Muslim and skeleton. And, uh, and I said, please let my, let my father stay with me. And my father said, you know, let us stay. We've gone through everything for, for, for many years. Now at the very end, please let us stay together. My father meant the end of the war, whether he meant the same, whether he meant the end of me, whoever knows. But anyway, he said, no, you, have, you look strong enough, so you have to go. So my father sort of half carried me and we walked away from him. When he called us back and with a smirk, he said, you can both stay. We didn't know what that meant, whether he, meant that it doesn't matter where you, where you are, your end is gonna be here or there. And he let us stay. Two days later, he came into the barracks and he, into the infirmary where we stayed instead of in the, the underground barracks. Uh, and he uh, waved a piece of paper and says, I have orders to destroy the camp. What I'm gonna do, I'm gonna hand you over to the allies. And he was true of his word on April the 2nd. Well, shout came into the barracks. And the Americans are here. We're free. 
That was liberation. What happened when the Americans came in and, and the camp was freed? What did liberation mean to you? Liberation was an empty victory because uh, by that time we realized that uh, not very many of our family would survive. Up to now, we were uh, very sick. You were, you know, hungry and fighting hours every day for survival. And um, we did not think about our families. But at this point, we knew we could start thinking about our families, going back, finding out who was even. So I did contract hepatitis fever. I was almost, almost died. But when all of this was over, we started going to uh, different camps. And we were starting to think about going back to Poland to see who was who? Who of our family would survive? Once you uh, went back to Poland uh, to find your family, you had had thirty-five members. Powder. Sorry, you had fought, you had had thirty-five members in your family before the war, including your parents and uh, your sister. We have a slide to share here. Uh, how many relations were you able to find when you went back to Poland? None of the people who are on this uh, picture survived the war. This is uh, only one third of the people that, uh, that of my family. Uh, these pictures were in Canada. They were shipped to my uncle who was in Canada since 1912. And so that's the only photograph I have. Some of the pictures were given to me by my uh, sister's girlfriend when I went to Poland and my, my mother's picture, which is in the middle here with the, uh, and the second, second row down, third from the left. And uh, uh, she, her picture was given to me by, by a housekeeper, my, mother's, my grandmother's housekeeper, to, who, to whom my mother gave it to in 1938. And uh, the rest of the people were gone. The only people I found was three cousins out of 14. And um, one uncle out of 12. And uh, that was it. And um, it, was a, it was a very difficult journey. And it was on this journey that I also found out that my mother and my sister did not survive my I found two aunts my mother's sister who were survived by righteous among the nations who saved them at a very difficult price they were they were you know they they risked their lives to save my aunts and uh, in the process they were hidden for oh, close to two years and uh, they of course they were together they fell in love one of my was my husband, was the husband of my aunt before the war, a Christian man. And uh, they survived the war. That's the only people that survived in, uh, of my immediate family. And the rest, uh, I had no idea what happened to it. My, I was told that my mother and my sister died in Auschwitz. You and your father and stayed well, you had to stay in, in Europe and in Germany for, you and your father had to stay in, in Europe for some time after that, uh, waiting to try and get somewhere, trying to get to Canada. Um, in 1946, you eventually uh, were able to obtain a visa um, with much trouble, how were you able to eventually emigrate to Canada? Well, uh, after I returned, I received, I came back to Poland. Uh, from Poland, we were in Germany. My father stayed in Germany. I went by myself to Poland. And uh, we tried to figure out what, we, what was our options. I came from Poland and I told them there was no way to go back to Poland. Poland was occupied by the Soviet Union and any infraction people were being sent to Siberia. 
uh, in, uh, and there was no way to make a living. There was no family. There was no reason for us to return to Poland. We couldn't, we would not stay in Germany. The only thing that we could go do is go to Israel. Hopefully we, in, uh, Israel was not a country at that time. So there was not a possibility to go to Israel. So the only possibility was Australia, South America or, or Canada, America. And, it, and there were very heavy quotas everywhere. So my father's brother, only surviving brother out of uh, eight siblings, he, the only surviving brother was uh, in Canada since 1912. So we tried to get to Canada. We applied in 1946, we applied for a visa, but uh, uh, we were rejected. And uh, we were rejected in, in 46 and in 47. And finally, we were allowed to come to Canada in 1948, only because uh, there was a as there was a quota into or to pe for people who enter in Canada. Of course, we know about it now. It was uh, they called the, the the situation the, the policy of none is too many. And so finally, in 48, we came to Canada. It was a Fantastic reunion. My father hasn't seen his brother for over 20 years. And uh, he was the only member of his family that survived. Uh, it was a very emotional situation in the, on the, in the railroad station of uh, Toronto. And the, my cousins, his two sick children were there. And, uh, you know, everybody, and we cried. And they say, well, now you're safe. You're, you're here. You're starting a new life. So forget what happened you starting a new life and that's what we tried to do we tried to start a new life my greatest desire was to uh, uh, get some education I, I in the camp i realized that the people no matter how much money they had no matter how many whatever the real estate they had it didn't mean anything the only thing that meant when you were when the difficult time occurred was your education you could always do something with the education so I was determined to become uh, educated. I wanted to become an electrician or an electronic uh, electronics engineer. And, but I had no, I had the slightest, I, I didn't think about it very seriously because I never went to school. I never had high school education. So I asked my cousin uh, the first day I was here, I said, what's the chances of me becoming, a, going into high school? I said. I figured I have to start in grade one and in, uh, in uh, grade uh, nine or something uh, since I haven't gone to school since uh, grade four. So I went to high, Harvard Collegiate and I got an examination right there on the spot. He wanted, my principal wanted to know how old I was. I reverted to my, uh, I made myself two years younger than I was. So in fact, I was two years older. So now I made myself to be 18 and so I was 20. And I, uh, in Germany, I studied, I studied mathematics, I studied trigonometry because I wanted to become an electronics uh, person, uh, an, uh, an electronics technician. And so I told him what I knew and he gave me an exam and I passed what he asked me. And so he made a, a curriculum from, I mean, a, a timetable for me, which had absolutely no spares nothing I could, grade uh, 12, he put me in grade 12 and he threw me in and I had to swim or sink. It was a very difficult, I didn't know how, uh, the, I did not know sufficient English to communicate. I had only rudimentary English that I studied in Germany the three years that we were there. And uh, I had to, I had to swim, you know, and it was a difficult time. The difficult time, the, the, mo the most difficult part was that I was by myself. I had like a thumb. I had no one to speak to. The kids that I was with were 16 years, 17 years old, in grade four, they were 16 years old. And uh, grade three, which I had to take some classes, they were 15 years old. I had nothing in common. I was 20 years old. I had uh, experienced the world. What could I tell them? I couldn't even, I didn't even have the facility to tell them what I, what I suffered. I didn't have the facility to tell them what type of life I lived in Germany. All I could do is say hello and, you know, and uh, speak about the daily day as to how are you and et cetera, et cetera. I 
didn't uh, couldn't go on a date because I didn't I couldn't even communicate with a date if I if I took one out. So I was very much by myself, which helped me in a way, because I had no friends. I went to I lived with my uncle. My father agreed to, to to let me go to school. He he worked, and I studied every day from eight o'clock in the morning till midnight. Either I was in school or I was studying a various subjects that I needed to, to do in, at uh, my uncle's house. And I devoted six days a week to that. The only day that I took off, Friday after, after supper, I went to a movie, to an English speaking movie, a cowboy movie, where the language was uh, sufficiently simple that I could understand what was happening. And then that's how I learned English. Slowly, 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 I learned English. I, I was surprised myself that I made grade 12 and grade 13 in two years. And in 1950, I graduated from high school, almost. I had one subject missing, but I, I was admitted to university because I had this, this, uh, I wrote the English exam outside of the high school. And I went into, into, and I didn't know what to, I wanted to go into engineering. But my, my friends, my, my family said, you can't go into engineering. You uh, are not going to uh, be able to make a living. There's anti-Semitism. People are, don't hiring Jews as a technician. So I said, so what I should do? He said, well, go into dentistry. So <laughs> I said, okay, I'll apply for dentistry. So I applied for dentistry. And I had good marks from grade 13, which I was surprised myself. And of course, uh, I wasn't admitted to dental school. And uh, the, the, but the dean of, of the dentistry told me to uh, um, go into honor science. And if uh, after four years honor science, I could then apply to go into dentistry. I really wanted to go into dentistry. So. That's how I ended up in uh, honor science. After one year, I realized that that's not what I wanted to do. I switched uh, into engineering, which is a big story again. I describe it all very in detail in, in my book, uh, I, which is I still available. And uh, I see we are getting very close to the end and we have many questions left. That, we do. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna skip ahead. And just ask you one more question, which I know people are going to want to hear about because we really are out of time. Um, so uh, you did go to university, you got an engineering degree, you had a career in engineering, and um, you've, your uh, charity and uh, volunteer work has been so substantial over the years, going on the March of the Living 19 times. We want to talk about March of the Living, but we're going to move on to that. Because the one question I do want to ask that I think want people will want to hear, and I know that you have stated that this was one of the most pivotal moments in your life, was that in June of 2016, when you accompanied Prime Minister Justin Trudeau to Poland and gave him a tour of Auschwitz-Birkenau. Why did you say that this was such a pivotal moment in your life? And can you tell us quickly what the impact of this trip was? Yes, yes, I will be very very, very short. You, can, you know that in 1940, in 1930, in 1943, I was standing before the gas chamber of, 19, of the Auschwitz-Birkenau. I went through hell to get into Canada. We went through, I went through a terrible situation to, to get an education. I finally got an education. I was very happy that I could establish a family. I was I was delirious from happiness that I had a wonderful family at this point. And uh, I worked in the community. I was uh, more going on the March of the Living. I educated hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people uh, through to, to what, it, what the show was about because I had, this, I had this desire or at least had this need to be this mission to tell the world what the six million people who did not make it what we went through. That was a mission which was burning in my heart, which I could not satisfy unless I was actively involved in Holocaust education through all the many years that I was in Canada. This was in 1948, and this is the 19, uh, 2016. 
70 years later. And uh, I finally, suddenly I got this opportunity by the chair of the, uh, the leader of the March of the Living, the Canadian leader of the name, uh, Eddie Rubinstein. He recommended that I be asked to go by the prime minister, recommended to the prime minister that I be asked to go to with him on the march. So I did, I got the request on Tuesday and uh, we're supposed to uh, leave on Thursday to go to Poland. But I, I told the, the, the prime minister's office, I said, I have, I have a number of, uh, of conditions before I will agree to go. He says, the first condition was that I have to go uh, business class because uh, my life, uh, I, I can't, uh, can't function if I have to go uh, uh, tourist class and I have to have my wife and at least one member of my family with me. And then I decided I need two members of my family. So to my surprise, they allowed us to, for my wife, my daughter, Arla, who is in front of you, and my daughter, Jennifer, which many of you know, granddaughter, go Jennifer. with me, with the prime minister to Jennifer Green, to go with, my, with the prime minister, Mike, I see Michael Levin there, and uh, and I see and he he and allowed me to to take these people and believe it or not, the prime minister uh, shifted two of his cabinet minister to a to a commercial flight in order to give me first class seats on his airplane, and we went to to his, to Poland. That was that was wonderful. In the middle of the, uh, in, the, in, the in the middle of the evening, just before I was going to sleep. The prime minister came out in his pajamas and greeted me and, his, and my wife on, on his plane. It was such a wonderful experience. That, remember, I was an ontemant. I was a nobody. I was a human. I was not even considered a human being. I was just considered a number. And here the prime minister comes to me and he invites me to go with him to Poland. And we go to Poland. We go through Auschwitz. We go through Birkenau. And there we stand, we stand in the front of the crematoria number, gas chamber in crematoria number three. And I'm staying there, we sing the Jewish prayers, we sing Kaddish, and we sing Al Rahami. And I'm standing there, I'm crying, I'm crying. And I look across to where the prime minister stood, and he's crying too. This was the moment that I realized I will never be able to duplicate because here it was, the leader of a Western nation standing beside me, who only a lifetime before, or 75 years earlier, I was there as a teenager and I stood there with zero hope. And here I was being with the leader of a nation, of the leader of the uh, Canada standing in front of this thing. This was definitely the, the crowning moment of all the work that I did through all the years, whether it was the creation of the Holocaust Center, whether it was the doc documentation program, whether it was taking thousands of students to Auschwitz, Birkenau, and Poland, and, and Israel, teaching and teaching and teaching. Finally, I had the privilege of being with the prime minister, and that was that was definitely a seminal type of uh, moment in my life, and it is to the day. I mean, the only the only thing that can uh, overcome that can that's greater than that is the birth of my great grandchildren. So I'm sure that the prime minister will excuse me when I say that his trip to, his trip to Poland, well, compared to the birth of my five great grandchildren was only on, on par. So that's that's what I have to say. And I will take any question if they have any time left. And uh, I, I was very excited that uh, the Wiesenthal people have asked me to come and speak to you. And uh, Arla just put the picture on, on the, this on the screen that showing this is my family. They're my four great grandchildren, my five, five nine grandchildren, five great grandchildren, five great grandchildren, five great grandchildren, 
uh, nine grandchildren with with all their with their with their wives and with their spouses, and uh, those who are not married yet, they have their their designated uh, special persons with them. So here they are, and you can see that this is my victory. This is my victory over over the Hitler uh, over the Nazis over Hitler, and uh, it is. It is the, the, the only final message that I have to tell you is the question is why do I go on talking about the Holocaust? I mean, the world knows about it. Well, why is it that I'm talking about it? It's all history, but that's the point. It is history. And we must make sure that it gets into the annals of the history, that people do not they consider it, that they know that that's history because we did not know of that history. It was not possible to us to think that one nation was going to destroy another nation. Today we know it. So today when we have a nation like Iran threatening nine million or six million Jews in Israel, seven million Jews in Israel with total annihilation to destruction, we believe them. And we have to make sure that our youth knows the history, our history, that knows what happened, how we survived, and knows what the tribulations, what difficulties we had through two centuries of persecution in Europe and everywhere else. We were thrown out of every single nation, out of every single country. We were not considered a nation. We we're not considered a people. We we're just considered the, the, the wandering Jew. Till 48, when Israel was created, we became a nation with a hometown, with a home a nation, with a home state, a democratic free state. And this is, oh, my dear friends, this is what we have to remember, that we have no other home, just Israel. And if we are thrown out, like we were, you know, we were, we were threatened with uh, pogroms in, in Germany, in France, and in, uh, even massacres in the United States, and in Canada, and, and all over the world, in, in Brazil, in uh, Turkey, Everywhere Jews were being murdered. The only place safe haven is in Israel. And that, my dear friends, is also not very safe because we still have to fight. We have to fight for the existence of the state of Israel every, as we did a few weeks ago when Hamas attacked Israel with 4,300 missiles. 4,300 missiles directed at innocent civilians in the state of Israel. The only Jewish state was attacked by Hamas, a religious order, a, a, an Arab nation that is pledged to destroy the Jewish nation and to drive us into the sea. This, my dear friends, is why I'm talking to you because history does repeat itself as we see, and we are a minority. And when I talk about the Holocaust and what happened to us, I'm talking about the minorities which we have in Canada. A few days ago, there were a Muslim family that was murdered because there were others by, by a supremacist. They were murdered on the streets in London, England, in London, Canada. There were people that were being murdered and Asian people being attacked in the streets of Canada. There are indigenous people that are being accused of causing all oh, this or that. They're not, being, they're not being recognized as a nation they're not been being given back their, 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 their religion, their, their nationality, their, uh, their, 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 we actually have committed a genocide, a, a cultural genocide against indigenous. And we have to recognize and we have to fight as survivors. We are, it's a comment upon us, it's a con that we remind the rest of Canada that not everything is right and that we have not solved all the problems that we have to go on fighting and we engage everyone, everyone in Canada and all the world to fight racism, discrimination, hatred, and anti-Semitism. And that is my reason why I'm talking to you today, why I'm gonna go on talking. I'm gonna go on another March of the Living at my health for fight. And I'm gonna take some children with my grandchildren with me. And we're gonna march from Auschwitz to Birkenau, a March of the Living, to show the world that we are here. 
and to remind them that we are not an easy pushover. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn it back over to Daniela. We're passed out of time. Thank you so much, Arla, and thank you so much, Nate, for everything. I think I speak for all of us when I was just sitting here listening to every single word, and it, it's just all of all of what you said, especially why this is so important and why it's so important for us to hear these stories and to remember and to never forget. I couldn't have said it better. Um, I know Michael, our president and CEO is here. I know as Nate pointed out, I know he knows you well and was instrumental in organizing the trip with the prime minister. So Michael, would you like to say a couple of words as well? Thank you, Daniela. Nate, that was, you're, you're such an inspiration. You, you always are. So it should be no surprise that you would be today, but really um, your strength uh, and uh, just your resolve to always look to make things better, to make sure that as a community, we are strong, as a people, that we are strong. Uh, again, it's inspirational. Arla, thank you so much for, uh, for, for uh, asking the questions and, and guiding the conversation. Um, you know, Nate, I, I, I still remember two or three days before you took off in that plane to, to, uh, to Poland, um, I was in Israel and I called you and uh, we had a discussion about the trip and what it was going to look like. And I, I don't think anybody could have imagined that it would be quite as powerful a moment as it was. And, and if Arla hadn't asked you, quite honestly, I was going to ask you about your reflections. Um, and uh, when I spoke to you and you came back, you, you, you gave a very similar description to that moment of standing there and you said to me, Hitler lost. That was the moment that I could say, look where I am now. Look, you, you didn't destroy me. You didn't destroy my family. We're here and we're playing a meaningful role. And, and I think the power of that one moment, Nate, um, is something that, again, just speaks to who you are and your strength all these years later. You, you, you haven't skipped a beat, man. You, you just keep going and it is, it is so, so important that we have your voice. Uh, so thank you to you, to Arla, for, uh, for, for bringing that voice with us here today. And I don't think there's anybody that minded going over time to, to hear you. Um, I also want to recognize uh, that we've got a number of former participants in our uh, In Conversation speaker series that are with us today. Ron Shimizu, uh, Claire Baum, Pinchas Gooder, uh, and Andy Reddy, um, and also Eva Mizels, who does a lot of work with, with Wiesenthal, is, uh, is, is on with us this afternoon. This speaker series, and, and Nate, you're the, the, the closing one for this season, has been a fantastic opportunity for us to partner with uh, the Raoul Wallenberg Center uh, for Human Rights, Erwin Kotler's uh, Center in Montreal. Uh, and we've not just spoken to Holocaust survivors, we've not just heard the testimony from Holocaust survivors, but also survivors. You talked about the um, plight of Indigenous peoples in Canada, and we have uh, also heard from a survivor from the Indigenous uh, residential school system. We've also heard from, uh, and it's Ron, from a, from a, a survivor from the Japanese, uh, from the internment camps in Western Canada. And uh, it's so important because it's every one of these testimonies and the people that bring them to us that again, uh, instructs us and defines us in the path forward and made exactly what you said. Racism against one of us is racism against us all. And it's when we reflect back on these stories, we, you know, we say, well, it can never happen again, but you know what, then it does. Um, it happens again and again and again. And we know that racism is resurgent in Canada at the moment. We know racism, racism against the Asian community, against the black community, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism. And we're, we're living that experience with anti-Semitism right now. And so many of our younger generation don't know how to respond. And I think that's why, um, again, today's session is so important because uh, we need to draw on the strength of you and the other survivors uh, to instruct us that we must never give ground and we must keep pushing and we must keep standing up for our rights um, and making sure that we're fighting hate, whether it be against Jews or any other group, 
um, because we, we, you know, we, we know where it ends and, and we will never ever be silent in that fight. Um, I wanna thank Daniela who has been our lead uh, on these uh, speaker series, on the speaker series uh, and the entire education team at FSWC under the direction of Melissa Michael and of course, Elena and Jordan uh, and Emily previously and everybody that worked so hard on um, bringing this session uh, to the community every two weeks. And we will be back in the fall, I promise you that. We're already sussing out some really um, good speakers to have join us. Uh, and I really do, I think it's important that we do um, survivors, again, Holocaust survivors, but that we also reach out to other communities because that's work that defines um, the Friends of Simon Wiesenthal Center. Um, with that, one last time, thank you to everybody that has joined us. I mean, I, I flip through and I see so many of the same names every couple of weeks, which is fantastic. And thank you for your commitment to Friends of Simon Wiesenthal Center, but to the people that haven't been on here before and got to hear Nate Leipziger and Arla um, presenting Nate's testimony. Um, I hope that you're going to bookmark this for, hey Pinchas, I hope that you're going to bookmark this and, and, and make sure that you join us in the fall when we will have a new series and we will continue working with the Royal Wallenberg Center to bring you um, testimonies and stories that are just so powerful. So with that, I want to wish you all um, a safe and a healthy and a happy summer and uh, we'll see you back in September. Thank you so much. Back to you, Daniela. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, everybody else. Have a wonderful summer. As you heard, we are working behind the scenes. We'll see you all in September.